Good afternoon. My name is Ian Rollins, and I'm one of the associate directors of the Waterloo Institute for Sustainable Energy here at the University of Waterloo, and delighted to welcome you to this afternoon's presentation. Thank you very much for coming out. Um, I'm delighted to welcome and introduce Dr. Guy Newsham. Dr. Newsham holds a PhD in agriculture, architectural science <laughs> at Cambridge <laughs> University, and he's been with the NRC for more than 20 years. He became group leader of the lighting sub-program in 1999 and was promoted to principal research officer, which is NRC's high, highest grade in the year 2011. Guy has a range of research interests and I'm privileged enough to work with him on a few of them. And these include those related to office space design, green building performance, lighting issues, and thermal control. And the topic of Dr. Newsham's presentation today is demand responsive buildings reducing on-peak electricity use in offices and houses. Dr. Newsham will speak for 40-ish minutes, something of the order of that, and then afterwards we'll have uh, at least 20 minutes for Q &A, formal Q&A period, and then I'm sure there'll be a chance for informal discussion for a few minutes after that. So if you have some questions, please make sure you scribble them down, we'll be very much look forward to taking them at the end. So, Guy, I'm delighted you made the effort to come out. I'm very appreciative of you sharing some time with us today, and I'll turn it over to you. Welcome. Okay, thank you very much, Ian, and uh, thank you to WISE for the opportunity to come here today and uh, share some of the results of the research we've been doing at NRC on demand response buildings. Uh, so for those of you who don't know what demand response is or what demand response building is, um, we'll be talking about that uh, during the first part of the presentation, uh, what demand response is and, and why it's important. Uh, and then I'll move on to a, a couple of uh, pieces of research that we've done addressing this topic. Uh, first of all, looking at commercial buildings, uh, so that's you know, office buildings, uh, schools, those kinds of buildings, and demand response in those buildings. Uh, and I'll be looking at both lighting, which is really the focus of our work, how you use lighting as a demand response strategy, uh, and also talking a little bit about work other people have done using uh, HVAC systems, like heat, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems uh, as a demand response strategy. And then I'll move on to some work we've been doing on residential buildings, and that's work that we've done in collaboration with, with Ian here at Waterloo. Uh, and again, looking at air conditioning uh, as a way of getting demand response in houses. Uh, and then finishing off, looking at uh, going beyond air conditioning and a variety of other techniques you might be able to use in houses to reduce peak demand for electricity. Uh, in the summer months will be the context of this presentation. Uh, so overall, uh, there's a, a long-term and continuing trend for energy use in buildings to grow. That's, that's been going on over decades and decades, despite what we do with building codes. Uh, energy use still continues to grow uh, as we get more and more buildings and more and more people. And although we have short-term recessions that knock that down a bit over the long term, um, it, it just keeps on growing. And perhaps more importantly for the context of this presentation, um, peak demand for electricity, so that's electricity which is used um, when, when demand is, is highest, when everybody's using electricity at the same time, uh, and you'll see that broken down a bit on the next slide, peak demand for electricity is growing even faster than uh, overall energy use. Now utilities, of course, are faced with the challenge of having to meet demand for electricity instantaneously uh, with, with supply. Uh, traditionally, anyway, with supply, and that means they have to uh, bring in extra generators at, at various times of the year when demand is high, or they have to buy power from neighboring jurisdictions, often at inflated prices. Uh, so having really high demand for electricity at certain times of the year can, can cost a lot of money, it can lead to grid instability, and in the worst cases, it uh, can lead to actual blackouts on the grid. And we've seen examples of that, uh, certainly in the early years of the 2000s, that was happening routinely in California. Um, it's happening in other parts of the world too. It's predicted that by 2017, the UK will be facing blackouts. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's an issue that's expected to, to get worse and worse as time goes on. So um, addressing this issue of peak demand is becoming a really important issue for utilities generally. So let's just break down that down a bit and look at overall electricity demand in Ontario. And I've taken, this goes back a bit, this goes back to the summer of 2006 which was the absolute highest demand ever in Ontario, I think, until last summer. Uh, so we can see that, uh, for first of all, Ontario is a summer peaking utility. That means it uses electricity at the highest level 
during the summer, not the winter, which makes it unusual actually for Canada, but that is the case in Ontario because of very high air conditioning loads in Ontario in the summer. So this graph shows you over a few days how demand varied across the province. And you can see um, an obvious variation from nighttime to uh, middle of the afternoon, big, big fluctuations there, and from weekends to, uh, to weekdays. So demand for electricity is not constant. It varies substantially by time of year, by time of day, and by time of week. Um, we can also see that uh, on the bottom graph here, we have plotted uh, price for electricity. This is the spot price, the market price for electricity. Most people don't pay that, but the uh, market operator still uh, publishes it. Uh, this is the, the uh, spot price for electricity. You can see how that varies with demand. So as demand goes up, the price goes up. And when temperatures were very high on, on August the 1st, 2006, and demand was at its very highest as all the air conditions were going simultaneously in houses and offices around the province, uh, peak price uh, for electricity came out as over um, 20 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, so what utilities would love to do is to shave that peak a bit, reduce that peak a little bit. And you can see over here that even very small changes in peak can have very large effects on the spot price for electricity. So just bringing this peak down a little bit would really benefit utilities and, and all of us in the long run because that would bring prices down as well. Uh, so they'd love to do things like, uh, like load shifting, which would be you don't change the total amount of energy that you use, but you move it around the clock. So you take a bit of that peak and you do it you use energy a bit earlier or a bit later instead. Or you can just simply do load shedding where you just use less electricity and reduce the peak that way. So various techniques you can use and the utility would like to explore using techniques like that. So if you were doing this in buildings, if you wanted to try and reduce electricity demand in buildings on those hot summer afternoons, how would you do it? Uh, well, this is showing how electricity is used in a typical office building on a hot summer afternoon. And you can see the obvious targets would be the biggest users, and that is air conditioning and interior lighting. That's where all the power is going on hot summer afternoons. So those are the targets. Uh, if we could reduce those somehow, we could make a reasonable um, indent on that, on that peak demand. And that's what we'll be pursuing over the rest of the presentation, is looking at how you might effectively reduce those um, in buildings going forward. But before I progress to that, just one little side note on summer versus winter peaks. As I said earlier, Ontario is unusual in, in Canada by being a summer peaking utility. Right, so it has a lot in common with places like California, where a lot of the other work on demand response uh, research has been done. Uh, and most work everywhere is really focused on summer peaks, and that's where our work is focused. But most of Canada is actually winter peaking. That's electricity demand is highest everywhere else except Ontario in the winter. Uh, now, the winter peaks tend to occur at different times. Summer peaks tend to occur on late summer afternoons when the air conditioning loads are highest, when people are getting home from work, but when commercial uh, uh, buildings are still operating. Winter peaks tend to occur early in the morning when any electricity associated with heating is also pretty high uh, and, and late in the evening. And you add to that things like lighting in winter and cooking and those kinds of things. So winter peaks, morning and, e uh, and later in the evening. But strategies that you can use to reduce peak, um, you can use them in, in sort of both scenarios uh, in different ways. So if you want to reduce lighting, well, you can do that in, in summer or in winter. And you can use basically the same techniques that I'll talk about for summer later on. Uh, if you come to wanting to reduce uh, cooling in the summer, well, it's in a similar way, you could reduce heating in the winter. So uh, similar techniques, you can apply them in both. But for the rest of the presentation, I'll be focusing on summer peaking scenarios. Uh, now, some people have described demand response as being what you might consider an app on the coming smart grid. So for those of most of you probably are familiar with what the smart grid is, the smart grid going forward is an attempt to integrate both supply and demand in a much uh, more coordinated manner. So we have various sources of supply, traditional power stations. We're also bringing on more and more renewables. Uh, into, the, into the scenario as well. And of course, renewables bring in extra variation on the supply side that wouldn't uh, have existed in the past. Then on the demand side, we have houses and offices and industrial uh, plants all demanding electricity. And we'd like to integrate this into a, into a much more uh, seamless whole using IT techniques to control the grid much in, in a much smoother way, optimize it, make it more stable, less prone to failure. 
uh, and also cheaper to operate. I mean, that's, that's kind of the smart grid philosophy. And demand response perhaps is the, the killer app on the, on the smart grid uh, in terms of what you, can, what you can do with this smart grid um, in, in a very useful way for, for society. And you can imagine in the future, operators of commercial buildings or even houses might get some kind of forecast ahead of, the, ahead of time as to what their building is going to do in terms of power demand over the day. And based on that forecast, they could start to make some sensible decisions, maybe incentivized by the utility to reduce power um, an hour ahead, three hours ahead, um, in order to uh, facilitate smoother operation of the grid. So we'll, with that sort of background, we'll now move on to some more specific techniques. So we'll get back to our commercial building scenario to begin with. And as I hinted earlier, to reduce demand in a, in a commercial building, the real targets in the summer context would be reducing air conditioning and reducing lighting. Now, I'm sure all of you are aware that most of our building standards and recommended practices are designed to optimize temperature conditions and lighting conditions for human occupancy. Demand response, of course, goes in the opposite direction. We're deliberately taking away cooling and taking away lighting in order to reduce peak demand. Um, and that obviously has the potential to cause discomfort for occupants. So the question for us, for the research that we did in this context was, you know, how far can you go how, and how fast can you reduce building services to reduce the peak without causing hardship for the occupants? I mean, we, we prefer to do this in a way that doesn't cause them undue hardship. Otherwise, they'll start to complain too much uh, and that will, you know, cause problems. It won't, uh, won't help us achieve our goal. So that was the research question for us, was how do occupants respond to all this and what kind of guidelines can we put in place to optimize the whole process? So we began with a bunch of laboratory studies, which I won't go into in detail. We have a, a couple of different labs uh, at NRC which are simulated office environments, which is set up to look like realistic office spaces, but are controlled laboratories. We bring in human subjects and do various tests in there. Um, so we did some demand response scenarios in these laboratories. We put human subjects in the labs, and first of all, we, without telling them what was going to happen, we started to dim the lights. We dimmed, it, dimmed them slowly, we dimmed them quickly, we dimmed them at different levels, and tried to find out at what point you know, did they squeal, did they really notice this was going on. So we found from a variety of trials that if you're in an office space with no daylight, you know, it's this kind of space or this kind of space, um, you can dim lights, as long as you dim it smoothly, a nice smooth ramp, you can, you can dim lights down by about 20% over 10 seconds without causing any hardship. Most people won't even notice it, and even if they do, um, the lighting will still be acceptable as far as they're concerned. But you can go further. If you don't dim over 10 seconds, if you dim over 30 minutes, really, really slowly and really smoothly, you can dim by 40% without causing any hardship. Now, some of you might be familiar, might even done it yourself, the sort of cruel experiment of boiling a frog, right? This is the same kind of experiment we're doing here. We're changing conditions slowly, uh, and by doing it slowly, uh, the subject doesn't notice. Uh, if you have daylighting in the space, you know, this nice lots of wind windows, lots of daylight in the space, well, then you can dim by 40% over 10 seconds, and people won't notice. Now, obviously, if you're dimming electric lights in the context of daylight, you'd expect that people will be less sensitive to electric light changes when there's lots of daylight present, and that's what we find. On the temperature side, we did a similar thing. In this case, we, we did boil the frog. We uh, increased temperature slowly by about one and a half degrees over two and a half hours. That's, that would be similar to the kind of effect you would get if you started to back off on the air conditioning. Uh, and again, we found that at that kind of rate, people didn't really notice, and if they did notice, it didn't, didn't cause hardship, didn't affect their performance on office tasks, didn't affect their mood. So those seem to set up some reasonable boundaries that would be practical to apply in, in office buildings without causing people concern. So those were the lab experiments. We then took this to the field. Uh, and the field work that we did focuses on lighting. I'll show you some field work that other people have done on the air conditioning side of things a little bit later. So we went to a couple of different sites, a federal office building and a large community college. Um, that both had lighting systems that allowed us to do this kind of demand response with lighting, you know, dimming lights slowly. And we applied the same kinds of, uh, of scenarios that we found that were successful in the lab to the field setting. 
So this is the uh, office building. This is the interior of it. So a very typical office building, lots of cubicles, very typical recessed fluorescent lighting in the ceiling. So over two floors in the building, we, we dimmed a total of 330 of these luminaires, these light fixtures, on our test days in the summer. And importantly, in both of these studies, by the way, at the start of the summer, everybody on the sites was informed that this kind of trial would take place, but they weren't told which days. So they didn't get any advance warning that this was, this was happening in, in the immediate context. So here's an example of a result from one particular day. So here we have um, light level, first of all, in this axis versus time of day. We had light loggers, various locations around the office building to measure light levels and make sure that the, the load shed that we applied actually did take place and to monitor what lighting conditions were, that, were, that we, we created. So here's lighting levels in the morning. Everything is normal, everything's stable. Then just after lunch, we applied our demand response, our load sheds on the lighting system. And we applied it in four different zones, and you can see we slightly staggered when, when it was applied, and we dimmed it more in, near the windows than further from the windows, like the lab studies would suggest. Um, so here's our light level, and you can see it did actually drop quite substantially when we told it to. It stayed down at a low level for a couple of hours, and then we brought it back up to normal at the end of the afternoon. The purple line is relative to this axis, which is lighting power drawn by the lighting system uh, over that day. Uh, normally about, um, uh, what are we at there, 21 kilowatts or something like that. Uh, and when we apply our load shed, when the light levels drop, of course, the power for lighting also drops. And you can see that we, re we reduced lighting power by, by over 20%, almost 25% during that uh, particular event. Uh, and our key measure for whether this was causing a problem for the occupants was were there any complaints. Uh, and Facility managers did not record any unusual level of complaints about lighting in the afternoon. Well, there were no complaints at all about lighting in the afternoon. So no indication anybody noticed it or it caused any problems. We are actually currently doing another study in another building in Quebec where we're sending out questionnaires on the afternoons of these kinds of events as well so get a more direct uh, level of feedback on whether we're causing any problems. Uh, but in this particular scenario, we just monitored complaint levels and we didn't find um, spontaneous complaints at all. Uh, for the college campus, a uh, much larger setting. Now, so we have a variety of different spaces now, not just offices, but also classrooms and corridors in multiple buildings. And more than 1,800 luminaires that we could dim in our load shed events. We also had an extra way of looking at whether we were causing problems for people. Every individual room at the campus had a, a manual wall switch that allowed the occupants of the room to manually dim the lights up and down. So we could also look during our load shed events whether there was more activity on these wall switches. Did people attempt to bring the light levels back up again uh, more than they would do normally uh, in response to what we were doing? So that was an extra measure that we had to look at whether we were causing hardship. Uh, and here's the result. Um, this is actually probably my favorite graph of all time. Um, it's funny what sort of turns scientists on, I suppose. Some people will look at great art. I like to look at great graphs. Um, this is there's five million data points on one graph. I'm very proud of this. So this shows you uh, total power draw by the lighting system versus time of day. And then every line is a day. So all the gray lines are normal days when we didn't do anything. So that just gives you some frame of reference that's what the normal level of lighting power was in these buildings and the normal level of variation uh, from day to day in these buildings. A very obvious diurnal pattern again from nighttime during the day over here. The uh, colored lines are the days when we initiated a demand response event or a load shed. So the blue line, for example, we did some dimming over 30 minutes like some of the lab studies. And you can see a very obvious drop in lighting power when the load shed was enacted. Uh, the orange line is our final load shed um, later in July, and there we did the load shed over one minute, so much, much shorter time frame. Uh, and uh, there's some numbers to go with those graphs to show you the extent of the, uh, the reductions in lighting power. Uh, and again, no complaints to the facility manager on those uh, afternoons when we did the load shed, and 
that extra measure we had, there, were no, there was no evidence of any additional use of those wall controls suggesting people were trying to override uh, the, uh, the things that we were, we were imposing on them, the load shed we were imposing on them. The uh, air conditioning work comes from California, what you might call our sister laboratory, Lawrence Berkey National Labs in California has been doing a lot of work on the HVAC side. Uh, they've begun trials back in 2004 and they've continued uh, right up until the present day, getting bigger and bigger and more and more buildings enrolled. Uh, early on in, this, in the trials in 2004, they were working with 18 sites. Uh, as you can see, very large uh, buildings overall. Uh, and they were applying mostly strategies on air conditioning. There was a few that looked at lighting, but mostly air conditioning. Here's some of the buildings that they did their work in. And the way that the system worked was they would send a price signal uh, to the building management system. And whenever the price signal for electricity crossed a certain threshold, the building management system would engage certain strategies that the building manager had programmed in. Um, so when the price for electricity hit 30 cents a kilowatt hour, some things would happen. And then when the price hit 75 cents a kilowatt hour, yes, note that number, 75 cents a kilowatt hour, um, then another set of strategies would, would kick in. Uh, so you can see typical strategies for, for HVAC uh, in office buildings. Uh, simply increase the thermostat set point in Fahrenheit from 76 to 78, and then from 78 to 80 as the price continued to get higher. Uh, the other buildings, they did it through changing the ventilation rate, so they would reduce the ventilation fan speeds, uh, thus reduce the amount of cooling that was delivered to spaces. Uh, there were some that did some lighting, but very few. It was mostly these HVAC uh, cooling type strategies that were applied. And here's an example result. This is just from four of the buildings that they looked at on one particular day in, in September with a high outside temperature. The, uh, the red line here shows you their prediction of what would have happened without any demand response event. Uh, and then here's what really happened as a, some of the four buildings. So the yellow area is the reduction in power draw across those four buildings. So you can see a reduction here, not in kilowatts now, one and a half megawatts uh, of reduction in uh, electrical power demand across those four buildings by using uh, cooling reduction. Yeah, there's a... Should I get the questions at the end? Can I ask it now? I, I think it's probably... The questions at the end. At the end. Yeah, I think it's probably easier if we wait till the end, just bearing in mind the, the filming that we're doing and audio issues. <laughs> so hold the questions and we'll, I'll get back to you. Uh, so that's a, a pretty successful strategy right there. And again, no complaints from the occupants regarding temperature conditions in the space. So just to summarize the, the work on commercial buildings then, we've shown that you can get substantial reductions in peak demand for electricity using these strategies in lighting and, and cooling. Um, there's little risk of hardship for occupants as long as you follow the guidelines that the research would suggest would be reasonable. But a very important caveat on this that I'd like to emphasize whenever I talk about this is we're talking here about temporary measures. We're not suggesting that just because people didn't notice, this should become the new normal. There's lots of other research out there that would suggest that the existing codes and standards and recommended practices for office spaces are appropriate. For the long-term benefit of occupants, the, the normal levels are what you should follow. Um, what we're talking about here are temporary shifts from that uh, under uh, conditions which are, which are almost emergency conditions. A few afternoons in a year when the grid is really suffering, uh, really stressed out, uh, then you can start to apply these things as temporary measures over a few hours. And in that context, um, these are things that seem to work reasonably well. And we're now seeing demand response coming into uh, various code standards and other documents. So RP1, which is the recommended standard for office lighting in North America, uh, the new draft now has a paragraph that allows for deviation from normal conditions uh, for these, these very circumstances. It happens to have that clause because I'm one of the co-authors. So we got that in, which is good. And LEED, the, the common green building um, uh, program that's out there from the Green Buildings Councils, now has a credit, an available credit for demand response. So it's coming into the mainstream uh, as it as we get mechanisms and guidelines that enable it to be successful. So now we'll shift gears from commercial buildings to residential buildings and, and talk about the residential issue. So the pie chart there just shows you in terms of total energy use, 
where it goes, um, uh, where, uh, where electricity goes uh, in Canada. So we talked about commercial buildings being about a quarter. Well, residential buildings are about the same. Um, so uh, what can we do in residential buildings to reduce electricity use, particularly on peak? And again, for Ontario, it's a summer issue. Uh, what I've plotted here is the average um, power draw uh, on an hourly basis from more than 1,000 typical houses in southern Ontario over three years. Uh, and we'll look at the winter trends first. The winter here, we can see three winters in a row. And you can see this uh, very repeated cycle uh, as the winter gets colder and darker. Electricity use tends to increase uh, as any heating uh, associated electricity also increases. More lighting is used when it gets darker and colder. People are inside more using power in their houses more. Uh, so that's a general trend that we see. Uh, but the obvious trend here is summer. What happens in summer? Well, things just go crazy in summer. Right? The, the total energy use in summer is about the same as it is in winter. But the peaks in summer are much higher than the peaks in winter. This is you know, hot days where air conditioning is kicking in all across the province um, on a few days throughout the summer. So the poor utility is trying to meet sort of the background level, uh, trying to have a nice efficient system to meet these sort of background levels uh, for residential loads and local distribution networks are put in place to try and do that. And then on certain days, things just fly off the scale. And how do they deal with that? It's, it, it's a real problem. Well, just like you can reduce air conditioning in commercial buildings, you can also reduce air conditioning in residential buildings. And we have a very popular program, voluntary program in Ontario to do that. It's called Peak Saver. Uh, many of you might be familiar with it already. You might subscribe to it already. Um, I, I do personally, and I think there's a, more than a couple of hundred thousand people who do now in, across Ontario. So this is a voluntary program. There's a small cash incentive to participate. You get a free uh, programmable thermostat. Uh, which is handy for the individual to use, but it also is controllable by the utility. So what it allows them to do is take control of your air conditioner on a few afternoons uh, during the summer in order to reduce peak demand uh, across, uh, across their, their jurisdiction. Uh, in some cases, the air conditioner gets cycled. In some cases, the air conditioner just has the thermostat increased. In the example, I'm going to show you results from um, when the uh, peak load events occurred, what the utility did was they just increased the thermostat set point by two degrees in participating houses. Uh, maximum of 10 events per year. The year I'm going to show you, 2008, where we have results, there were five events. Uh, there was only one event in 2011. Occupants are allowed to opt out of the event, but they don't get any advance warning it's going to happen. So opting out is maybe not obvious, but you, you can do it. Uh, this kind of thing has been tried in various uh, other places in North America, um, in various pilot programs, not quite as, uh, as widespread as it is now in Ontario. Uh, and we did a review of, uh, of that work, uh, myself and actually a, a co-op student from Waterloo, uh, did a review of that work a few years ago, uh, looking at uh, what kinds of uh, demand savings were achieved by residential air conditioner cycling or direct load control of air conditioners by utilities, and you can see a range of uh, effects here from 0.3 kilowatt reduction on average to uh, 1.3 kilowatt reduction. So let's just put that in context. I'll bring, bring that graph back up again. So on these big days, you can see on average houses are being about two and a half, three kilowatts. Uh, so if you're able to reduce that by something in the range of half to a one kilowatt, that's a pretty substantial reduction. So the question for us in our research was, how does Ontario compare? How does the peak saver program compare in terms of its reductions compared to what happens elsewhere in, in North America. So we had data from a uh, Southern Ontario utility, uh, up to 1,300 households for three years. Uh, back in 2006, 360 of these households completed a survey, short survey about some very basic characteristics. You'll see that on a, on a following slide. Uh, and 205 of these households were participants in the Peak Saver program in, in 2008. Uh, and Importantly, there was almost no overlap between the peak saver households and the survey households. They were really two separate uh, subsets of the larger sample. So we're going to focus on the 2008 data here and ask ourselves the question, how much did peak saver save? We have hourly data from these houses. We know which ones were peak saver and which ones weren't. How much did peak saver save? Uh, 
Um, the household characteristics uh, here, this is the data from the ones who did the survey. We have a reason to believe that they were representative of the, of the whole sample. Uh, and this is very typical uh, household profile for, for Southern Ontario. Average house size, just over 2,000 square feet. Um, average electricity use for the year, 8,700 kilowatt hours per year. That's very, very typical. Incidentally, about two to three times the average household electricity use in Europe. Um, so pretty profligate, but pretty normal. Um, for electricity use, um, most people don't use electricity use to heat the house. They don't use electricity use electricity uh, to heat the water. It's mostly gas. Uh, vast majority of the sample have central air conditioning. So a very typical subset of southern Ontario households. So. The question is then, how do you measure the effect of peak saver? Here's an example. This is the average power draw of the peak saver houses on July 8th, 2008, which was a peak saver event day. Average power draw versus time of day. The shaded area is the four hour peak saver event. Um, and first of all, I would ask you, did peak saver have an effect? I think it's pretty obvious that peak saver had an effect. Um, the question is, how big was the effect? Right? That seems like a pretty simple question to ask. Well, it's a very simple question to ask. It's not so simple to, to answer. Uh, you might say, well, it's pretty obvious. You just figure out what would have happened without the event. Something like this would have happened. Then you subtract it, and that's the, that's the size of the effect. Well, that's, again, easy to say, not necessarily so easy to calculate. There's actually four different ways you could, well, at least four different ways that you could look at this. And we did it four different ways and looked at whether the choice of, uh, of what method you used had an effect. And as you'll see, it, it does. Probably the, the thing that would...